Welcome to Casual Friday. I have a couple of tidbits today. I want to tell you about a couple of new projects that I'm either in progress on or about to begin in the planning stages for. I want to tell you about a vintage knitting book that I ordered a couple of months ago that finally came in. And then I want to answer a question that came up in the comments about ribbing and the stitch pattern sequences of ribbing. So let's get started. So the past couple of weeks I was talking about the Shetland hat that I made that was the free pattern that came out for Shetland Wool Week 2019. So Shetland Wool Week occurs at the end of September, beginning of October every year, but six months prior to that, at the end of March, they announce the new um, free pattern in celebration of Shetland Wool Week, and that happened last Friday. So the new free pattern is called Katie's Kep, K-E-P meaning hat. The stitch pattern is more of a traditional Farrell style of stitch pattern in that there aren't really long floats that would occur in the back like there were for uh, last year's pattern. So I took a look at the different colorways. Again, there's four different colorways and each colorway is designed using the, uh, the yarn palette from one of four different Shetland wool producers. So colorway number one is in a yarn from Jameson and Smith. That's the company that I bought yarn for um, to knit my roadside beanie. So I've used uh, Jameson and Smith yarns. The second colorway is from Uradale, which is an organic producer of Shetland wool products. And so that's colorway number two. A uh, colorway number three is from a company called Shetland Hand Spun and those are in natural Shetland colors. And then the fourth colorway is from Jameson's of Shetland. So that Jameson and Smith is different from Jameson's of Shetland. So because I had tried Jameson and Smith yarns for the roadside beanie and I really liked the Jameson of Shetland colorway for this year's beanie, I thought I would order some yarn. It turns out <laughs> that uh, first I was looking, because I live in the U.S., I was looking at uh, people who sell it here in the U.S., and everybody had those colors for that colorway were all sold out and on back order. So I thought, well, I'll just order it directly from Jameson's of Shetland. And so I was putting yarn in my in my uh, cart, and I went to check out, and it said, we cannot uh, ship to your country. And at first I thought it had something to do with like the lockdowns and the stay at home or something. I couldn't, maybe there weren't as many flights coming. I couldn't figure out what it was, but I looked at the website again today and they have a message for US and Canadian customers. Jameson's of Shetland can't ship directly to customers in the US or Canada because of an agreement that they have with a company called Simply Shetland who distributes their yarns. So if you go to Simply Shetland, you can find out who their distributors are, who the yarn shops are in um, the US and in Canada. So you can find out locally who has it or even maybe online. Here in Minnesota, we the yarn shops are closed to foot traffic. Uh, for a while they were doing curbside delivery and now they're doing uh, just shipping like by mail. So in Minnesota that's, we have to, at this point, we have to order yarn to be shipped by mail for the time being. But anyway, that solved that mystery for me. So if you're interested in Katie's Kept, the pattern is free and you can come up with your own six colors that you want to knit it from. I can't do that. <laughs> I, it's, it's six colors and they're all being combined in different ways. I'm partially colorblind. I just don't have the, the ability to look, especially looking at colors online and trying to figure out if those are actually going to work and if those are true. Uh, I, I really would need to be able to see things uh, next to each other. But some people may have a big stash of all kinds of Shetland uh, 
wool yarn available to them that they can mix and match and experiment on their own. But anyway, the pattern is free. So regardless of whether you decide to use Shetland wool to knit it, which I would recommend because it's a really interesting uh, wool to work with for color work, um, or if you want to use some other kind of yarn, you can do that as well. So the next little tidbit I want to talk about is that I'm planning on doing some live stream videos in the very near future, possibly as soon as next week, just getting it figured out because the equipment situation is different from what I'm doing right now with a casual Friday or what I do with the technique videos with my overhead camera. It's a, it's a different type of setup. So I'm thinking what I'll be doing is some sort of a Q and A type of thing where people, because in the live stream, people can write comments and then I could see them and answer questions. I might even potentially be able to demonstrate um, on camera to it to answer a question about something i'm just not sure how it's going to work i'm not sure if it's going to work for me i'm not sure if it's going to work for you but i'm going to try it so this type of video is going to be different than when i uh, upload a video and then post it and then announce it on social media like facebook or twitter or 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 on Ravelry. Those videos, uh, I embed those links so you can watch those videos on those particular platforms just as they are without even going to YouTube. But for the live stream, um, to, first of all, to be notified that it's happening, I, I believe you will need to go to YouTube and subscribe to the channel. And then there's a little bell when you subscribe, there's a little rectangular, uh, button that says subscribe when you're on my channel if you haven't already but and next to that is a little blue bell that you can click on and you can say how you want to be notified like occasional notifications or if you want to be notified immediately and so you will get a notification um, when I start live streaming. So in YouTube, when you subscribe to channels, you can always go to your subscription page and see what the latest videos are. And when there is a scheduled live stream, you will be able to see that there's one coming up and what time it's going to happen. So those are ways that you can be alerted of, of when a live stream is going to happen. So I'm just letting you know that it's probably going to happen sometime next week. I have to just figure out what time of day I have to get all the logistics uh, hammered out and um, then I will schedule a live stream for next week. So if you have questions about me or about a knitting question or something like that, um, you can uh, come onto the live stream and you can ask that question and I will do my best to try to keep up with as many of the questions as I can. So last week I was talking about the downside of not having more than one project on the needles at one time. <laughs> and that is if I get stuck or if I get distracted or if the current project I'm working on takes a lot of focus and I just need something mindless. If I don't have something, it's even just overwhelming to try to figure out what I should knit. So I, I've been wanting to get myself set up with some uh, simple projects lined up as well as my next sweater project, um, in part so that I just have something to go to next without having to think about it. And also just to kind of plan out uh, in case I get stuck on a project and I need a break from it. So uh, one of the things I did was I just recently sent a package to my daughter in the Netherlands. And in that package was uh, two pairs of socks, one pair for her and one for her boyfriend. So it was the first pair of socks I knit for him. And I knit them when we were all down in Santa Fe, or I started them when we were in Santa Fe over the holidays. And what had happened was um, well, as we were driving from Minnesota to Santa Fe, I finished the first sock. And then we got to Santa Fe and I was finishing the second sock and my daughter and her boyfriend were in the country, but they were in California and they weren't in Santa Fe yet. And I was going to need something to knit. And so I said, do you have a tape measure? You know, you, I need to, you to measure his uh, ankle so I can get the right, I can cast on for the sock leg. And she couldn't, she couldn't find the tape measure anywhere. So then we were <laughs> trying to guess, well, based on, you know, uh, previous male friends of yours that I have knit for um, does you know his, are his legs bigger than than so and so's legs or smaller or you know what do you what do you think and she's like I don't know but his his feet are really wide and big around 
So I decided to guess and I decided to compromise between uh, the smallest male ankle that I have knit for and uh, one of the other and the larger end of what I have knit for which is nine inches ankle to 10 inch ankle. My brother, I think is bigger than that, but he's, he's an outlier. He's, he's a great big guy. So most of the men I've knit for have been between nine inches and 10 inches. So I decided to cast on a sock for him that was um, nine and a half. Um, or assuming that his ankle was nine and a half. So the sock itself was eight and a half. And uh, I knit that for him and then they, they finally got there before I got to the heel and I could take all his measurements. And it turned out he has a nine inch ankle and a 10 inch ball of foot. So I, so I was going to have to, regardless, I was gonna to have to make some adjustments when I went from the leg to the foot. Um, but I, I didn't rip out that leg. We, I tried it on him and he thought it fit okay. And um, so now I just uh, sent them a text the other day with a picture of my sock yarn stash. And I said, do you see anything in here you like? <laughs> and so they circled the few things that they liked. And I was looking at the photographs of them wearing the socks. Like my daughter, I know how to knit socks for her. I just make them to fit me and they'll fit her. But whenever I knit socks for someone for the very first time, I really look at how they fit their foot and ask them questions about, does this fit you the way you like? Because sometimes it'll fit them, but maybe they like it firmer, they like it looser, or they like, you know, whatever. I was looking at it and I thought maybe the toe is a little loose. And she said, no, the toes are fine. But he says the leg of the sock is a little bit looser than his athletic sock. So it's a little bit, it fits, but it's a little looser than what he's used to. So I said, okay. So I went to look for all of his measurements because I usually when I knit something for the first time, I open a Ravelry project page, <laughs> create the project, and I write all their measurements, put in my gauge, you know, put in what, I, what it is I'm planning to do. And I had his measurements in there. I had no information about how long I had knit the leg. I started to panic a little bit and I was like, how am I going to figure, how did I even do this? How did I, you know, did I write it in a notebook because we were out of town, but I had my laptop with me. Why wouldn't I have done this? And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> you have a spreadsheet. So I have a spreadsheet. I always use a spreadsheet for every project, but for some reason it just, I didn't think of it. And I have a spreadsheet that has multiple tabs on it. Every tab is for a certain person and for a certain type of sock. So I might have one uh, for my brother that has a heel flap and gusset sock and another one that's got say a peasant heel. And if I change the yarn and use something with a different gauge, then I'll have to adjust that particular spreadsheet to accommodate the different stitch or row gauge. But at least the construction is the same and I can keep track. So I use the same yarn for him that I'm using this time, just a different colorway. So I saw exactly how many uh, rows long I knit his uh, leg and I saw what, what I did for his heel and the length of his foot and all that. So I could use all of that information um, in order to guide me for this sock. So this is the first sock. It only took me a couple of days because it's a, a sport to DK weight yarn. It's Cascade Heritage Prints. 150 so it has a 150 grams because it's a six ply sock yarn rather than a four ply it's a little bit thicker and it's a discontinued so sometimes when i'm looking for self-striping sock yarn online because a lot of the local shops don't carry it anymore because maybe it's not as popular a project as it used to be but i really like self-striping sock yarn so i'll like webs which is yarn.com they get all the discontinued stuff um, from various yarn companies and so this was a bunch of discontinued stuff and i just bought every color that they had at the time so these are a brown and a tan solid stripes with the blue, light blue and white, and then a darker blue and white um, and for the speckled parts. And the heel that I'm using is called the plain heel. And it was one that I tried in December on their socks. Um, it was an experiment with it. And what it is, it's like a peasant heel or an afterthought heel. Um, it's that same type of heel construction, but instead of waiting until you are almost done with the foot and then going back and putting the heel in, you knit the leg, then you knit this heel, and then you go forward, which I love. I was just, you know, 
trying to remember exactly how I was doing it for him versus for my daughter. Um, the, the nice thing about this plain heel is that it's actually pretty easy to add additional circumference, which means that the heel will be longer and can fit um, people who might have trouble with this style of heel. And so I'm trying to work out the formulas for this. I've done formulas for the afterthought style or forethought style of peasant heel where you do go back later. And I've, I've done a series of videos on how to modify a good fit for those heels as well as for short row heels because they have the same sort of shape. It's very similar, but it's slightly different. And so I'm just trying to make sure that my sort of formulas that I use to figure out that other process would work for this. I think it might be a little different. I am planning on making a video on how to do this style of heel because I think it's super useful and it allows you to try the sock on as you go, just like you would for any other type of sock heel. So that's the sock and so I'll be doing the second sock and then I know which yarn I'm going to be using for my daughter for her socks and then I have in mind to do a pair of socks for my brother. So I've got all my sock projects kind of lined up for the next couple of months so that I know that I can always just turn to one of those if I get stuck or panicked or bored or I just want something mindless to work on. Back in early February, I ordered eight vintage knitting books. So these books were all published between 1940 and 1949. They were written by two women, Margaret Murray and Jane Coster, who were sisters-in-law. And the first book was called Practical Knitting Illustrated. And that particular book, I think, was very popular and was uh, reprinted multiple times throughout the 1940s. Um, so that was the very first book, and I was able to buy that from a seller here in the U.S. But the other seven books were only available from sellers in the U.K. And so I ordered all of them, and I received all of them within a couple of weeks, except for one of them. And that one that I didn't receive was the second book in the series, published in 1941 originally, called Knitting for All. And it didn't come and it didn't come. So when I, when I ordered these books, they give you this like a, a, a expected delivery date, like a window. And some of the windows were really long. Like a couple of the books, they said, well, it'll be there by the end of April. And I was like, wow, that could take a long time. Every book had, came within about 10, 10 days, two weeks tops, except for this one. And the expected delivery date on that one was like March 4th, something like that. Well, March 4th came and went, and the book never arrived. So I gave it another day or so, and then I, I emailed the, sell, the seller and said, did you use any tracking? Are you sure you sent it? You know, I never received it. All of the other books came. Didn't hear back from them. So then I contacted Abe Books, which is sort of the clearinghouse for all of these independent sellers, and I said to them, I didn't. I didn't get the book. And so I heard back from a customer service person said, well, we'll contact the seller. And if we don't hear within 48 hours, we'll automatically um, put in uh, for you to get a refund. And I'll, and I'll let you know. Um, if you hear from the, the seller, please let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll be in contact. Never heard back from them either. I didn't know what was going on. Well, I looked at my account. Sure enough, they had refunded the money. They just didn't tell me they were refunding it. And so then I went and looked to see if anybody else had had this book. One person had it. I remember when I looked originally, there were a couple of people who had this book. So there was only one person who said they had it and it was going to cost twice as much as they originally paid. But I was hopeful that I would get it. I, it came. I got it. And it, you can actually re read the name of the title on this book. Some of them... Like especially the red ones, they're very hard uh, to see what's on the on the front cover of these. And this one seemed like pretty substantial. One of the things that I loved about these books is that they all they had similarities to them, but they were all unique in some way. And so I, after seeing all seven of the other books, I really wondered what was going to be different about this one and it it has differences so first of all it was published in 1941 so uh clothing rationing had just begun in 1941 so i wasn't sure that there would be anything mentioned in here just because of the 
the lead time that is needed for public for publishing. This book has a significant section on remaking garments in here. One of the things is that they don't actually have as many patterns what they do instead is they'll have a pattern for something and then they show you all the different like variations for uh, how you could make this into a sleeveless what they call jerklin uh, jerkin which is like in the u.s we just call this a like a vest but it's like a crew neck you know round neck sleeveless pullover and they call it a jerkin so you how to do that and then you just edge it with like double crochet for a couple of rounds or something like that and then they show you how to upsize it or how to how to um, upsize it without waist shaping for the older or fuller figure or the older woman it's really interesting they, they really show you all the different ways that you can change something uh, starting with uh, with a initial basic pattern and that is what I find so amazing about this series of books is that they really develop uh, knitter skills in some of the books. Some uh, some of the books are, are strictly patterns with just a little minimal information about the principles of knitting, but there, I, I would say at least half of them really have significant sections on ripping out uh, old sweaters or reblocking them so that they fit better or modifying things or how to what to do if you don't have enough yarn in one color um, to make a sweater like how you can use contrast yarns for that they had at least one book if not two on how to combine fabric with with yarn um, with knitting in order to produce a garment you know, during the war there might you might have been short on one or the other and couldn't make anything but then how you could combine things together so for me even though the you know it's different fashions the principles are the same and really fascinating and to me just a real gold mine of information one of the things as I was going through and looking at this, one of the things that really delighted me, I was flipping through and I, I don't know if you can see this. There's some little notes right here. So somebody was actually using this um, to knit with and I just love seeing that. I mean, some people, when they buy a used book, they want it to be pristine. They don't want any marks on it. But for me, if I look at like a cookbook, especially that had been owned by somebody previously, a cookbook or a knitting book or something, and I see the little notes, that just creates a connection um, to, for me um, to a knitter from... 80 years ago that I think is so cool. One of the things I love about my grandmother's vintage patterns, because the patterns themselves, a lot of them are kind of hideous from the 60s and early 70s. Uh, but what I love is going through them and seeing her little notes for her little notations for, for where she left off or just tick marks or, or just things like that. I just I just love that. So I'm going to look for more little notes in this book um, to see if I can find them. But <laughs> so they have um, a hat in here. It's called the three cornered hat and then subtitled it's foolish, but it's fun. And it almost makes her look like Catwoman or something. So I think, you know, it's, uh, it's great that they have a, a sense of humor in here as well. So last week I asked you guys to weigh in on what you thought I should, I should do for my next sweater project because I wanted to get it lined up and possibly even start working on it um, because I'm at a point in my vintage uh, 1920s sweater where I've been working on it sort of past my uh, devoted tolerance. So I've said many, many times over the past few years that I have a three-week tolerance for working on the same project. Uh, just solidly and I have been working well over three weeks on that vintage sweater and I'm getting to the crocheted bits which I'm not as confident and I'm doing some experimenting but sometimes I just want to be knitting so the stuff that I'm going to be doing on that sweater right now is not knitting and I want to have something to knit so I wanted to I hadn't given any thought about what my future project actually should be so I gave you guys four options and said what do you think what would you be interested in uh, in seeing. And the four projects uh, were the following. One was an Aran sweater that I had designed in the, toward the end of 2018. I had bought the yarn two years ago from this Irish sheep farmer whose website is uh, Zwartbliss 
Ireland and she's got all this different social media um, accounts and she posts on Twitter multiple times a day like life on the on the farm and I was just really charmed um, by the things that she posted and I wanted to try out uh, the yarn from her sheep. So I ordered that two years ago and then it sat in my stash for about six months. So then I decided to sit down and actually design uh, the sweater. And so I went through different iterations. I did several videos as I was working through the design process and explaining how Erin sweaters are kind of um, laid out and, and then showing my swatches and uh, for that process. So I uh, cast on for the sweater and I got about, uh, I think I got through the first ball of yarn and then I realized I was not using the needle size that I'd originally intended to use for the sweater. I had intended to use a smaller needle than you'd normally use for the yarn in order to uh, create a firmer fabric that would hold up the cables but would also resist pilling. The sweater that I'm wearing now was made from worsted weight yarn, just a regular four ply worsted weight a yarn, but I knitted at a at a gauge that you would with a needle size that you'd normally use for DK yarn so which is a little bit thinner so it's at a firmer gauge and one of the things that I love about this sweater is I think it's about 12 or 13 years old now there's no pilling so I loved that it's in such good shape and it's really because of how firm that gauge was so that was my original plan for this uh, sweater but there were a couple of obstacles that I was facing with it uh, one was well, the, the reason I ended up knitting uh, with a different needle size is because I was using a circular needle with silver tips. Uh, I think it was probably an interchangeable set. And I had both needles sitting on my desk. And when I actually did the final gauge swatch, I used the size six needle, not the size four needle. I have other needles that are color coded and I would have known, but I hadn't recognized it. So all of the calculations I did and all the knitting I did were correct and I got the size I wanted, but it was a little bit, it was like a regular gauge for worsted weight yarn rather than this firmer gauge. But I was also struggling a little bit with the yarn because it was pretty sticky and it, it was hard to work at a, at a firmer gauge. So I just, at that point, I just put it to the side and what happened next was I was sitting in my office staring out the window thinking about geez, I wonder if there were ever knitting patterns published in the, in the newspapers a hundred years ago. And from there on, I took this deep dive into vintage knitting. It was just a random thought I had while I was frustrated with this Aaron sweater and trying to decide what to do about it. Um, did I want to keep going forward? Did I want to start over with the smaller needle? But I kind of dreaded that because the yarn was hard to work with at such a small gauge. You know, I, it, so in order to avoid that, I, I looked for something else to do. And what I found was vintage uh, sweaters. And that's what I've been doing for the, over the, since the end of December of 2018 when I put this Aaron sweater to the side. So I've done, I'm on this 1920 sweater is my fourth vintage sweater. So that was option number one was this Aaron sweater. Option number two was to knit something um, either from this book, like one of the, the patterns that's already written up or to design something using the concepts and the stitch dictionary and, and all of the advice that this book uh, gives. So that was an option. And I had yarn that I had purchased in Santa Fe uh, from a yarn shop that was owned by a Danish woman. And I, so I originally bought that yarn thinking, oh, I'll use it for my next vintage sweater project, not knowing what that vintage sweater project would be and, or, you know, what era it would be from. But it was, that was my original thought. And then when I met this Danish uh, woman and she was actually friends with the author, um, I thought later, oh, it makes a lot of sense to use that yarn I bought from her for this sweater. So that was kind of what I paired this, that yarn, which is a worsted weight, navy, heathered, Peruvian uh, wool yarn. Um, so that was what I was gonna use when I made one of these sweaters. So those were the first two options. And the next two options were to knit a, a 
a sweater using a charcoal gray yarn for most of the sweater and then to have a cable that was made of this yarn I dyed at a retreat and so the cable would be used like in a couple of different areas of the sweater I just sort of have a vague idea of what that might be like and haven't spent any time actually figuring out well, is it going to be a lot of cables, but most of the cables are gray, or is it going to be a plain sweater with just the sky? You know, I haven't really thought it through, so, but that was the third idea. And then the fourth idea would be to use this series of books that I have purchased from the 1940s to do my next vintage project, which would be a 1940 sweater, because I've done the 1900s, 1910s, I'm on the 1920s, and I've done the 1930s. So the next one would be 40s. But I hadn't thought about what one it would be. I haven't figured any of that out. And it would take modifications because these are always in one size. And I'm typically bigger than the women were in the 1940s. So those are the four first choices. Now, early on, in the early hours, they were pretty evenly divided. Like there was no clear winner. But pretty soon, the Danish sweater started uh, inching ahead. And a couple of people remarked, I think you should do that Danish sweater. You seem the most excited about that one. And I thought, oh, you know, I probably am in many ways because it's something new and different. It's a texture, which I love. It's a new tradition. It didn't seem like it'd be that hard to actually knit, uh, particularly if I picked one of the patterns that was already in here. And then Saturday, almost everybody was commenting, Danish sweater, Danish sweater, Danish sweater. <laughs> So I'm like, well, it's clear that, that you guys prefer the idea of me knitting the Danish sweater. And the other thing that I had said was that I didn't want to buy any yarn. Um, so I had the yarn for the Aran sweater. I thought I had the yarn for the Danish sweater. I also have a sweater's worth of yarn that I could use. Oh, I have the yarn for the Intarsia cable sweater. And then I have a sweater's worth of yarn that I could use for the 1940s sweater. And I, but I, it's a natural color and I probably need to dye it, which could be part of the adventure. So I didn't think, I, I wasn't gonna need to buy any yarn. So I started looking through this book and I found a pattern that I, that I liked the first time I saw it. And I continue to like it. And um, I'll show you in here. It's called Annie's sweater. So I like that. So you'll see the, the split hem at the bottom is pretty typical of these traditional Danish sweaters. They have that split hem and they do it in a couple of different ways. I really like, you know, these elements. So, so I was looking at, first of all, this, I think this woman wearing the sweater designed this, like maybe she had taken some classes from Vivian Hooksbro and, and so she had designed it. And so she designed it to fit her and she's smaller than I am. So already there would be a modification. And then I looked at the yarn and it's fingering weight. It's like, oh, I didn't count on that. I have worst weight. So I started looking through the book and all of the sweaters in the book are between six stitches per inch and seven and a half stitches per inch. And I started thinking about this and realizing that these were, you know, fine gauge, by our standards, fine gauge sweaters, and that if I used worsted weight yarn, first of all, I'd have, I would have to design something because it's everything in here is fingering weight. Uh, and secondly, it would change the scale of the design elements quite a bit. So instead of a star that's like this big, you'd get a star that was like that big. So instead of 140 stitches for the front or the back, you'd only have 100 stitches. So it's it's a quite a different scale. And it would require me uh, designing from scratch, which is not a terrible thing for me to have to do, but uh, it's not something that I can just start knitting right away, which is kind of my plan. And, and then I was like, oh, I really want to knit it with, you know, at the right kind of scale, which means I would need a fingering weight yarn, which I don't have. And the yarn shops in our area are closed. So they, they are taking orders, but they're having to ship them out. So whatever yarn I would need, I would, ha I, I have no way of like looking at them and seeing is this what I want or looking at colors. Sometimes when I'm trying new things, I'll get a couple of different yarns and then I swatch each of them and see what I think. 
And so I didn't, you know, so I, so I don't have that. I didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, the Danish sweater, it can't happen right now because I, it, it's just not, the pieces uh, aren't coming together for that. So, so then I thought, well, I really like the 1940s, sweater. I really want to break from vintage sweaters. Uh, I just want to do something that's not a vintage sweater. Again, I haven't really designed this intarsia one, so that's not ready to knit. The only thing that's ready to knit is the Aaron sweater. So I took it out and I looked at it and I thought about what the problems were that, you know, that I could remember and, you know, the sticky yarn and was that really a problem or not? And so I did a couple of things. One was I looked up the yarn, the Zwart Bless yarn. And I have this, um, when I learned to spin, when I bought this yarn, it was before I learned to spin. So I, I kind of knew some of some terms about, uh, about spinning, but not really very much. Uh, and I certainly didn't have books about this. So I had this fleece and fiber book that is by Deborah Robson and Carol Icarius, Icarius. Uh, and so it has all these different breeds in here. And one of the things it says about Zwart Bless is that it's a really sturdy, hard wearing yarn. So that is good to know. Uh, number one. Uh, number two that I remembered about this yarn was the sheep farmer in Ireland, the Zwartless sheep farmer. She lives in County Kilkenny. And I knew that she, cause she goes sometimes to the, to the mill where her wool is spun into yarn cause she sells her yarn herself. Um, but she's also designed wool blankets that use uh, the wool from her sheep. And the blankets are black. And then they have these white stripes that represent the blaze on, on the sheep's um, forehead and nose. So it's a wider stripe and then thinner stripes for like the, the white tail. And then the, the feet are either two of them are white, have white stockings, could be three or could be four, but they all have at least two. And so the stripe, the, she has these stripes, uh, white stripes that are woven into these blankets that represent the Zwartbless sheep. And so she sells those two, but the mill makes her yarn and weaves her blankets that she sells. So, ah, so I remembered that that mill was in County Kilkenny. So I looked it up and there's some uh, videos about the mill. And I, and cause I remembered that they used a spinning mule. It's called the spinning mule. And it's where they have multiple spindles that are winding a yarn on. And it's one of the early uh, mechanizations of, of uh, spinning yarn in factories was using these spinning mules. And what I remembered about them was that they, they sort of copy the movements that a hand spinner would make. And so they, they, drew, they pull away from the source of the wool and then they, and then they twist and they wind up. So they're pulling away and then they, they wind up. Whereas other machines that are spinning are it's a continuous spinning motion, it's not the same. And so I was thinking about that because now I know how to spin and I know that there's different methods of spinning. And I was thinking, wait a second, is that the long, is it, is it mimicking the long draw draft, which is wool and spun and that's what the Shetland wool that I was using this that's so sticky was. So the Swart Bliss yarn was sticky and it's sticky the way the Shetland yarn was. So I'm like, are those yarns sticky because they're wool and spun or are they sticky because of the kind of, of wool it is? I think it's sticky because they're wool and spun. And then I was looking up confirming that a spinning mule creates wool and spun yarn and it does. And normally a uh, wool and spun yarns are really good for color work or, or basic things and they, they fluff up and they're warmer. And so that makes them good for sweaters because they're so warm. But for cables like this, a worsted spun yarn is usually what you would want. And, but it's also a very smooth yarn, which is why I made, was able to work it at such a fine gauge and so easily. So I started thinking about, okay, I have sticky wool, a sticky wool and spun wool, and I wanna make an Aran sweater. Uh, and it doesn't make sense for me to actually try to make it at a firmer gauge because it kind of will destroy the whole, these properties that a wool and spun yarn has, which is that it's warmer. 
And so I thought, well, I don't want to compress the wool any further. It's a, um, a strong, sturdy wool. So I think it'll hold up. I'm hoping it'll hold up. This is an experiment. It's a learning, exp a learning experience for me. So what I, anyway, what I decided to do was to continue with the Aran sweater as it was on the original needle size and that I could just go forward with it. So that is what I have been doing uh, the past couple of days. I started on a second ball and I don't know if you can see through there. I've got, you know, I've been working through the center of it. The main cable and the center panel is a 24 row repeat. And then the other cable panels, one of them is eight rows and one of them is 12 rows. So every 24 rows there, all of the patterns are ending at the same time. So I had done the ribbing and then two of those repeats um, when I had put it to the side. So since then I've done one more repeat, one more uh, 24 row repeat. When I do one more repeat, I'll probably be close to the underarm for the back. It's a pretty simple construction. I don't have the neck shaping worked out yet, but even if I had, I probably would have changed it since I've been working on vintage sweater patterns. I've discovered that I like a narrower neck. One of the things I don't, I love this sweater, but one of the things is the neck is kind of wide. And part of that is because I went a little skimpy on how long I did the ribbing because I just wanted it to be done. So I could have made the, the neck ribbing a little longer, but I also made, just made the neck wider than it turns out I actually like. I, I like a closer fitting neck. So that's something that I know about myself now. And I will keep that in mind when I am knitting this. This is going to be a drop shoulder sleeve. I'm not going to probably do saddles like I have in here. I don't know if you can see. I've got these saddles here that run all the way down the sleeve, which I like, but they're kind of a pain to do. I'm not really interested in futzing, especially with such a dark yarn. It's so hard to even see the cable patterns because this yarn is so, so dark. So I'm really wanting to keep things simple. So I'll do some shoulder shaping. It'll be a modified drop uh, shoulder. So there'll be some uh, underarm bind offs and then I'll pick up stitches around the armhole and I'll knit the sleeve down that way. The cables are going to look the same right side up or upside down. So that is not a concern that I'm knitting the body in this direction and then the sleeves in that direction. Not a problem. So I had made this decision that I was going to have to wait on the Danish sweater and I was just going to get going on the Aaron sweater and I started working on that. And then I went downstairs and I realized, oh, I had a package in our front hall. When we're getting packages, we're letting them sit there for a day or two before we order them. So I'd ordered some yarn uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was working on the roadside beanie because uh, the yarn that I use for my technique videos, I use this yarn because it, it's a brown sheep nature spun. This one is a little bit light in color. I realized I really like this kind of medium color. I've never used this yarn for a sweater. I, I had never even known about it, I don't think, until I was looking for yarn uh, for technique videos. Uh, because I, I like a medium uh, worsted weight yarn, medium color, because that shows up best on camera. It's not too dark, but it's not so light that it, it uh, dissolves into the background. And it, it just shows up at photographs pr pretty well. And so I found this when I would go to yarn shops and I would always look at what worsted weight yarns they had and what, co what medium colors. And so I, one of the shops had this nature spun and I tried it and I really liked it. I had only ever used brown sheep lamb's pride, which has like 15% mohair and it's a single. It's not a applied yarn. This has three plies. Eventually I just, I like, I really like this. And so I need to find it and need to get it in colors that are going to work for videos. And like, these are not colors that a lot of people are going to be using. I don't think for sweaters and things because I just, I'm not finding them in yarn shops. So I order it from Paradise Fibers, which um, they have spinning supplies and yarn supplies there in Washington state. And I, they have a storefront, which is closed right now because, because of um, the lockdowns everywhere, um, but they're still doing shipping. So I was wanting to look for some other colors besides this, because I just get a little bored with it and they're, they're, pictures were so tiny of the colors and I was trying to, trying to see. So I thought I'm just going to go to the Brown Sheep website and look at the colors there. So I found them there 
and I was able to pick out the ones I want ordered them from Paradise and so that package came it was sitting in the front hall I knew what was in it I wasn't a surprise because that's you know I'd intended to order all that so I open up the box and the first thing that I see on top on the top of the box are, are these three balls of yarn and I was like I didn't order that for my swatches and it's super thin. I'm like, what the heck is this? <laughs> and I pull it out and it's nature spun fingering weight. And I started thinking about it. I'm like, oh yeah. When I went to the Brown Sheep website to look at the colors, the bigger pictures, I saw that they also have fingering weight. And I thought, and I was working on the roadside beanie and I thought, you know, it'll be interesting to compare the nature spun to a Shetland wool. Because the thing about the nature spun yarn is you get more yardage per 100 grams than you do with a regular worsted weight uh, wool. And the fingering weight yarn has a lot more yardage in it per 100 grams. And yet it's, it's really the same thickness. You'd think it'd be thinner, but it's the same. What happens is when you wash it, it kind of blooms. And, and yet it doesn't, it's not a woolen spun. It's, so there's something different about how they process their yarn when they before they spin it or while they're spinning it. I did ask them. I I emailed them and I never heard back. So I was curious about how this would work in a stranded color work project. And it was a spontaneous purchase. It wasn't something that I had planned. So I'd for, totally forgotten about it. But what it means is that I have 100% wool, non-superwash, fingering weight that I can experiment with for my Danish sweater. So I have yarn on hand that I can try out uh, with stitch patterns and planning and, and seeing. So if I like this yarn, the yarn weight, then I can go pick a color that I like. So that was uh, a really happy thing that happened is that I didn't have to try to order a bunch of different kinds of yarns that I wasn't sure of. I just had some appear on my doorstep magically. So I want to answer a question that came up in the comments this week for a video that I published a couple of weeks ago. It's a Technique Tuesday video that talked about which ribbing is the stretchiest. And I was comparing three different types of ribbing with stockinette. I was knit one purl one, knit two purl two, and knit three purl three. So those, those ribbings all had the same number of knits as purls alternating back and forth and ultimately the repeat was an even number of stitches and then this person wanted to know have I ever seen a need to use a ribbing pattern like knit two purl one or some other odd number of stitches for the repeat and the answer is certainly um, you can certainly do that but there's a lot more that you can do besides so let's say you really like, you just like knit two pearl one ribbing and you wanna make a hat, maybe a plain stockinette hat and you want a hundred stitches for your hat but you really like knit two pearl one ribbing. Well, three doesn't go into a hundred evenly but it does go into 99. So if you had, if you cast on 99 stitches, you could use knit two pearl one ribbing just like you wanted and then as you transition to the body of the hat, if you actually do need 100 stitches, either because you just want 100 or because you're using a different a stitch pattern for the body of the hat that you, where you need 100 stitches, you just increase one when you are working your last round of ribbing. And so you can always make these like um, minor adjustments that allow you to use the ribbing of your choice um, as you transition from, from there to the main body of the pattern. But you can actually do a lot more with your ribbing patterns than, than picking a very consistent repeat. I have knit many things where the ribbing sequence can, might span the entire width of the front of a sweater, for example. In fact, if we look at my Erin sweater here, if you look at the bottom, which uh, I don't know if you can see, it looks like all of the knits are, there's two knits always, and then you have your columns of purl stitches. And, but if you look on the back, what you'll see is that sometimes I have two knits on the back, which from the front would look like purls. Sometimes I have one and sometimes I have two. And that's because I needed to increase a lot of stitches 
to get uh, the right number for the cable pattern, you need a lot more stitches. I need 100 stitches for my ribbing, but I needed 120 for the body of the sweater. So I had to increase by 20 stitches. And I also wanted um, those cables to grow out of the, the knit columns of the bottom of the sweater. So I arranged things so that a column of knit two stitches could turn into a cable, but I also had to add increases, 20 increases across the entire body of the sweater. So that was you know one way I did that. So in, for each one of these panels, I had a different type of ribbing. Sometimes it was knit two purl two, sometimes it was knit two purl one, and sometimes it was a little bit of both. But you just can't tell that so much from the front. So I do that a lot. Um, I, I, I want the ribbing to make sense and I want it to be symmetrical and I want it to, to make sense as it transitions into the other body of the sweater. But that does mean that you can vary how you uh, work your ribbing. So you could have a, a ribbing sequence that's you know 25 stitches wide, uh, or it could be 30 stitches wide, or it could be 12 stitches wide. And it, it could be using knits, uh, knit one, knit two, purl one, purl two, anything like that in different combinations uh, in order to make it work with the other pattern. It can be tricky to do that, especially if you're trying to do that plus doing increases. Um, but it just goes to show you that you can always change and manipulate the ribbing according to your own aesthetic. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Rocks, rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.